bankrupt governments are financing the bankrupt banks. And so one day this uh, Ponzi scheme will come to an end. Who, who puts it to an end, though? Because if the Federal Reserve just keeps printing and the governments keep accepting their fiat currencies, how does this thing finally come to an end? I suppose it comes to an end uh, in various ways. First of all, at some point, you could have uh, significant consumer price inflation. And we have already higher consumer price inflation than what the government is publishing. Most families, they suffer under rising insurance premiums, under rising educational costs, and so forth and so on. And uh, fees, I mean, the other day I was driving from New York Airport in Jersey to New York City. The tunnel fee had just gone up, up by 50%. These are all some sort of tax increases, some sort of price increases that the consumer has to pay. And so the real incomes of ordinary people goes down. In other words, the incomes that are adjusted for cost of living increases. And then you get the dissatisfaction among the population and the governments will have to kind of pacify this dissatisfaction either through increased handouts or by blaming a minority, or taxing a few rich people, but it's not going to help much. And eventually, I think the governments may choose war and go to war in order to justify more spending and in order to essentially blame somebody else for the economic ills. Mark, do you, do you think the oil price over $100 right now is going to be sustain sustainable for the rest of the year? Because we're already seeing demand destruction in the West. Well, you know, oil is very volatile. And on this subject, I just wanted to mention, basically, the Keynesian clowns like Mr. Krugman and Mr. Bernanke, they believe that government intervention with fiscal and monetary measures, will smoothen out the business cycle. In other words, you have less fluctuations in the economy because of the government's intervention. But I argue that because of the government's interventions with monetary and fiscal measures, you have higher economic uh, volatility and much higher financial volatility. So if you ask me about the oil price, the oil price before the rate cuts came in 2007 were at $78 a barrel. When Mr. Bernanke slashed interest rates in September 2007 on the Fed fund rate from 5.25% to zero, oil doubled to $147, although demand went down because we were in recession in the second half of 2007 and first half of 2008. And then from the peak in July 2008 of $147, oil dropped to $32 within six months in December 2008. So we have a drop from $147 to $32 within six months. That's the kind of volatility Fed policies introduce into the marketplace. And my view is, if you ask me where the oil price will be, I just don't know. My sense is that demand in the Western world is flat to down. It continues to grow in emerging economies. The supply of oil is constrained. And you have the possibility of some military conflicts in the Middle East. I happen to believe that the whole Middle East will blow up in flames eventually. <laughs> but again, I don't know when. So I don't want to be short oil. If anything, I would rather be long. But technically, all industrial commodities look like weakening. It's like I said, the stock market looks like it will go down in a either correction or more serious decline of 20 to 30 percent. The same, uh, I think, can happen to industrial commodity prices. Now, Mark, um, Americans, uh, our lifestyle, as you know, Americans live um, 
on financed everything, our clothes, our shoes, our cars, our homes, and then we live an hour away from work. So we need the $2 a gallon gasoline. Um, our homes are, you know, far away from, from, uh, from cities. We live in suburbia. The American lifestyle, how much longer will Americans enjoy this current lifestyle? I mean, are they down to their last few years yeah, here? Yeah, but I, I just want to mention one thing. You know, I grew up, I was born in 46, so I grew up in the 50s. And in the 50s and 60s in Europe, Americans were like oil sheiks yeah. and kings and uh, aristocracy because at that time, say, one U.S. dollar bought four francs, 50, uh, six francs, and with a dollar, you lived like a king in countries like Portugal, Spain, Italy, and so forth. And then, because of the dollar depreciation over the last 30 years, they, if you work for an American company in Europe, in the 50s and 60s, you had a huge salary. Nowadays, they get paid less than Europeans. And uh, so I think that Americans don't realize it themselves so much, but their standards of living has actually already declined relative to the rest of the world. Say, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you go to China, people had nothing. Today, they have very modern cities, they have cars, they can buy luxury goods, they have money. Not everybody, but say 10% of the 1.3 billion Chinese probably are middle class. So the world has changed a lot already. And I happen to believe that the uh, standards of living of the typical American family say the median household or the average household will continue to decline. Mark, in closing, uh, you're a very successful entrepreneur, newsletter writer, economist, analyst. What advice do you have for young people today, uh, specifically in the West, uh, because that's where our audience is? What advice do you have them as far as degrees or industries or or how to how to thrive during the next ten years? Well, I mean, first of all, I, I wouldn't now consider myself to be that successful, but uh, I think that uh, I acquired over time a certain knowledge in economics and in uh, asset markets because I was kind of always fascinated to look at the formation of prices and price movements over centuries and over uh, decades and so forth. Uh, and my advice to young people is, I don't think that the degree is important. If you have parents that can pay for your degree, then I would take one. If I had to go and borrow a lot of money to have a degree, I'm not sure I would take one. But... Uh, I would try to work first for someone who is successful in any industries, whether it's in construction or in engineering or in uh, machine tools or in the service industry and acquire knowledge from him. And of course, you, whatever you have to do, you should do with a lot of passion and heart and like what you do. If you like what you do, you will do a better job than if you're indifferent towards your job. And I think there's still plenty of opportunities in every field. And by the way, when we talk about success, I think in life success comes on many different levels. Monetary success is just one of them. The many other ways to be successful in life. If you have a happy family and you're a good family father, it's also a measure of success. And uh, if you can help other people, it's also a measure of success. So I think that our society maybe overrates monetary success and associates success with having a big house, having three cars, being able to go on holidays and live the good life and so forth, when in fact these are all relatively superficial symptoms of success. Wow, thanks, Mark. That was a that was a great answer to that question, and I hope young people and all people really understand what you just said there. Uh, Mark, if somebody would like to reach out to you or subscribe to your newsletter, where's the best place for them to go? They can uh, go and visit uh, gloomboomdoom.com or 
send me an email. <laughs> Mark, thank you so much for your time. Uh, really a privilege pleasure. to talk thank to you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.